Good evening, everybody. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Julian Jones. I'm vice principal of uh, Harriet Watt University, and it's a real pleasure for my university, together with our colleagues from Edinburgh Napier University, to be hosting this lecture. Both Harriet Watt University and Napier University are very much committed to sport and exercise science. We have academic courses, sports bursaries, scholarships, and we're both investing in world-class facilities. So this lecture is really a very good fit. Of course, you're here to hear our lecturer, uh, James McCallum. James, welcome. Thank you very much for doing this. We look forward to the lecture. You've chosen as your title, How Do We Keep Inspiring a Generation? With admirable tact, you've avoided pointing out which generation it is that you wish to inspire. And I see we have several uh, represented here this evening. The Edinburgh Lecture Series continues to bring truly inspiring people to our city. James, you're internationally renowned. Your career spans 20 years. You're a leading Scottish racing cyclist with numerous British and Scottish titles uh, across uh, all the disciplines on road and track cycling. 2014 Commonwealth Games will be your fourth and you'll become Scotland's most capped Commonwealth cyclist. So, in this lecture, I gather we shall have a, a retrospective, including the legacy of uh, London 2012, and a prospective, too, Promises of Glasgow 2014. James, we're all yours. Looking forward to hearing the lecture. Well, um... Fantastic introduction. It's quite funny when you uh, when you come at something like this and you actually see someone talking about you. It's kind of like you know, all kind of I made a moment of realization there because uh, this will be my last year of competing as a professional athlete because I got to that point where it's getting harder and harder and harder. And the the generations, not only the young generation but the older generation, is uh, starting to put me to the sword every now and then. So. Um, yeah, James McCallum, professional cyclist, it always gives me a, a great sense of pride when, uh, and I feel very privileged to call myself a professional cyclist because, as we'll talk about in a few moments, I was just a little kid from Glasgow, done loads of different sports, and uh, cycling was really the one that I kind of stuck with. My grandfather uh, was a, a pretty good cyclist in his day. He raced against... Uh, one of Britain's first, if not the first world champion on track, uh, Reg Harris. So he's, um, there's a bit of history with the sport within my family. And every one of uh, the boys in the family um, was given a, a racing bike at sort of the, the right age of about 10 years old and tried to be coaxed into doing sport and doing cycling. So um, as it turns out, I was the only one that done it out of about eight of us. Uh, so, Luckily enough, I've managed to uh, stick at it. So, yeah, it gives me enormous uh, pride to see the words professional cyclist below my name there. So, we, will, we shall start. So, how do we continue to inspire a generation? It was, it was a question I kind of thought about when I was looking at London 2014 and its strap line of inspiring a generation. And you're thinking, right, what does that really, really mean? And how is that going to work? So, a little look at my journey. I started racing at the age of 11, uh, age of 15. I, I got a real, I got hammered from the age of 11 till about 15 year old in races. I was decidedly mediocre. I was just kind of going through the motions of coming through a point where uh, I was doing many sports and trying to find my place as a young teenager. And it wasn't until the age of about 15 where I had a chance to represent Great Britain at the European Youth Olympics, which is one of the kind of the first things that Great Britain kind of pushes the youngsters into. It's multi-sport, like the, the big, big, big Olympics. So you get a chance to sort of taste sort of international competition and, and you see a lot of um, the athletes now who are representing at uh, the top Olympic level, they've all kind of came through that pathway. Um, so that was my first representation of Great Britain. I also represented Great Britain kind of through the under 23 uh, point of view from 15 to 23. And then I had my wilderness years, which we'll come on to. Um, age of 23, my first Commonwealth Games were in, in Manchester 2002, and that was just, that was a moment where I realised that 
I'm actually quite good at this. I can, I can maybe do something in this sport. And it was a really, really refreshing moment for myself to actually realise that I'd found my place. Because you're always, as, as a teenager in like early 20s, you're always trying to find your place in the world and what, what am I going to do? What am I going to be? So that was kind of like my realisation that the cycling stuff might actually be for me. So then, four years on, <laughs> a lot had changed uh, and I went to the Commonwealth Games uh, in Melbourne. Now, um, that for me was the moment where my career just ignited. I went across all the way to Australia and, and spent four months, poor me, training in the sunshine, uh, preparing for Melbourne. And I was there actually primarily as a helper for the team because the way cycling works is that you've got leaders and you've got helpers and the helpers do what they can and according to their strengths. Now I was there as a helper because pretty tactically astute and can kind of see situations happening generally before they happen. So I've got quite a good instinct for racing. And it was actually that instinct that got me into the position where I could then come away with a medal. And uh, unfortunately, I never managed to get the gold, but I got beaten by some unknown guy called Mark Cavendish, who's done absolutely nothing <laughs> from this point on. So, pardon the uh, spelling. I'll blame that on the wife. She did the presentation for me. Um, I went full time in 2006 um, for uh, a, a team called uh, Ploughman Craven, which was a relatively small British team. Um, since then, I've moved on to racing for a team called Endura Racing, which was also uh, Scotland's first professional team. After that, another really quite well, probably Britain's most well-known team after Team Sky, Rafa Condor JLT, and recently I've joined a new team called NFTO, which stands for a bit of a mouthful, which is not for the ordinary pro cycling. So I started now, 2006 is when it all started happening for me. And since then, I've accumulated a few British championships, a few British medals, and a handful, a big handful of Scottish championships. And this year, as I said, it's going to be my last year. My aim this year is to go to my fourth Commonwealth Games, which for me, the thought of going to one Commonwealth Games is, well, this is, this is pretty cool. To go to the next ones and win a medal was, was, was fantastic. And I thought, yeah, maybe the Olympics is on, is on the horizon, unfortunately. It wasn't. So um, my next game was obviously w was Delhi, which was a very, very, very weird moment in my life because you were there doing a, a, a massive sporting uh, monument, but it just felt you were in, in prison because you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't do anything, you were followed around by armed guard everywhere, and it felt the whole the whole situation just felt really, really, uh, you know, quite intense and quite. It just didn't feel like you're at a sporting event, it just felt like you were just kind of like me, just being shipped about to go and perform and then and come back to basically live in this, another big prison, which was the, was the village, so you weren't allowed to do anything. So it was pretty much the same as Glasgow, but I'm only joking. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's my very, very quickly running through my career. Now, that's, that's my moment there. That is, when I look at that and I, I see myself, I think, when did all that happen? How did that happen? And, and literally, that's like moments of your life. It's like that race was 22 minutes long, but six minutes of the race is actually when it all happened. But in that six minutes, there's only two minutes of actual racing where I had to make split second decisions. So from that point of view, it's, it's very, life's defined, the way I see it, is by very, very small moments. And seeing those moments and taking those moments and using your initiative to try and push that forward. Now, it says peaks and troughs because <laughs> The first story is mainly a trough, which comes off the back of this. Um, in 2005, when they announced the team before we left to go to Melbourne, uh, I was walking along Rose Street, actually, with uh, you know, just a normal every day, just thinking, oh, hopefully I'll get my phone call this week about going to Commonwealth Games. And uh, actually got, I got a phone call uh, a few hours later, and the selector and the national managers come on the phone, and they said to me, Right, wee man, there's been a, a slight hiccup with your nomination. And I was like, okay, what's that? He says, well, um, somebody's wrote a letter saying, Jesper Callum didn't really perform in 2002. He's not really done much since. He had a, a few months out of the sport. Nah, he doesn't really, I don't think he's, he should be going to this Commonwealth Games. Despite the fact I'd done all the qualifying, I'd done the times, but some people just, sometimes, they don't like looking at facts. So basically, I had to wait the best part of six to eight weeks just waiting and waiting and waiting through like the whole 
uh, the part of the year when you when you ride a bike, you ride your bike in the sunshine and it's lovely. But at this point in the year, it was like November, December. It was really dark and it was. Oh, I want to go out training because I want to go to Commonwealth Games, and then you're like, Am I going to go to Commonwealth Games? So it was a lot of like dark moments, just thinking, Why am I doing this? And I just had to keep on reminding myself that. Just keep trying. Just keep getting ready. Go to the games. Go to the games. Go to the games. Thankfully, <laughs> three months later, I got to stand up uh, on the podium and show that person exactly what I thought of them, but without actually having to tell them exactly what I thought about them. So for me, that, that was a, a great moment, which just shows that you see this picture and you think success. Oh, it's great to have success. But the, my sport and life in general, I think uh, cycling is a great metaphor for, for, uh, for life where it's all about the struggle. I've, no, not everyone can relate to this moment, standing there being the champion or the fancy pictures in the Tour de France when the guy's winning the stage and he's standing on the podium getting the kisses and getting the spoils. It's the struggle is the bit where everyone connects. And that's kind of, for me, what sport is. It's more about everyone here has been through a point where they've been doing something and it's got really, really hard and you come up against that brick wall and you just learn how to push through that brick wall. For me, that was... That was a moment, and I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. But thankfully, I'd done the right thing. Got the head on, went there, went about the job, came back, and it was just the most bizarre situation, just coming off a plane, and everyone wants to talk to you, and you're suddenly you're a skinner superstar for five minutes, and it was, it was unbelievable. Now, that was luckily the moment where I then got noticed, then turned professional, the year after won a national championship, and... Uh, that's basically been, that was the moment where everything changed for me. There's been a lot of injuries as well. There's been uh, broken shoulders, broken arms, broken toes, broken teeth, broken nose. So it's, it's not all been a, a very, very smooth pathway for myself. So if anything, I've got that to pass on to anyone who I may at any point try and help inspire and help them to keep you know, pushing through you know, the hard times. So that's my peaks and troughs. Now, my inspiration in my career, this is a... Uh, I look a wee bit different there. That, was, that, is, that is literally me at 11 years old having taken up cycling. Um, it must have been about six months previous. Um, I got a new bike for my birthday off mum and dad. Tiny wee guy with baggy cycling shorts and a, a bike which is obviously far too big for me. But you always get told when you buy a bike at that age, ah, you grow into it. <laughs> I did eventually. But by the time I grew into it, I was on another bike because that was out of date. But anyway. Um, my inspiration in my career, I would have to say, is my, my parents have been such a huge influence in my life. They've always been there for me, uh, and at no point was there any expectation on me to do anything. They always wanted me just to go out there and do your best. Do everything that you can, take control of everything that you can take control of, and just go out there and do everything that you can, and 100% do your best. And for me, that was really, really enlightening, because I can go to events and I see teachers, I see parents, I see you know, brothers and sisters, I see loads of people just shouting at kids, come on, come on, you've got to win, you've got to win. But that's not what it's about. The only one person can win. But for some reason, everybody wants that person to be the person they're with, which is understandable because everyone invests a lot of time and effort in trying to help these people. So for me, my inspiration was all, always my parents. I got to the lucky part of my career, 2002, where I bumped into a guy called Chris Hoy. Now, I knew Chris when Chris was just Chris, and he was mediocre. Now he's Chris Hoy, this massive, massive legend of sport. And, and he transcends across all sports, and he's also transcending across all cultures now, because everywhere he goes, he's just recognised. And the thought that coming from a sport which is very, very niche back in 1990, where you would meet at a bus stop at the end of the street, don't tell anybody, to it now be a mainstream sport where I can actually walk through Starbucks in my cycling kit and not get laughed at, it just shows you how far the sports came. <laughs> which is quite nice, because now, as a teenager, dressing like that, <laughs> tough times. So um, I was lucky enough to, come a, uh, to happen upon Chris and be with him at a moment where a lot of things changed within cycling. There was a lot of momentum coming from 2002, but I'll talk about that uh, a little bit further on. But 2006, we came back from... Melbourne Commonwealth Games as the most successful Commonwealth Games team ever. And to be a part of that, you know, it's a really, really proud moment. And you think, I've, 
I actually put something into that. And they have people like Chris Hoy, Craig McLean, there to actually ask them, what do I do? What, what, do I, what can I expect from this? And their words to me were, do everything. Because you never know when it's going to be taken away and it will never ever happen again. So they said to me, go to talks, go to the dinners, just you know, mingle, get out there and just try and push yourself. And I really, really think that helped an awful lot. Just a very, very simple bit of advice is to go out there and just do things. Get yourself out there, you know. Explore a little bit and try and use what you've done to further your career, whether it's within the sport or out of the sport. So, very, very lucky. Got to a fantastic point where we came back and all this success was starting to happen. This momentum was building and it actually, it was quite a slow burner because we now look at 2012 and we think, oh, we won loads of medals. Fantastic. But if you look back 10 years, Great Britain maybe won one medal in cycling. And it's how did that actually happen? So what changed? A lot of things changed, but one of the main things I think that changed when I speak to people like Chris, and I've also been lucky enough to grow up alongside Bradley Wiggins, who is Britain's first Tour de France winner, Brad and I raced a lot as juniors and as under-23s, so I'm relatively friendly with him, but he's, he's big time now, so <laughs> I'm just a small fry. So anyway, one thing that definitely w was noticed was that there's been a huge, huge mentality shift. I've taken a few references from a, a few books, and this gentleman here, Bill McFarlane, some of you may know him as a BBC broadcaster, worked for the BBC in sports, uh, also worked for many newspapers in, in Scotland. Bill's got this book called Drop the Pink Elephant, and he basically talks about pink elephants being the way that we talk, and the way we act, and certain words that we say. And a, and a good example is we water down words, and it's, very <laughs> it's a very Scottish thing. Maybe not so much a British thing as a whole, but definitely from Scotland and the west of Scotland, you have a real tendency of kind of just playing things down, and, and not really taking, when somebody says to you, you did a great job, you kind of go, I was kind of all right. Yeah, it was a great job. I got it done. I, I, the deadline was, was covered, and I came back with X and Y, and we, we achieved it. Celebrate that. We don't tend to do that. Other words that we use, hopefully, probably, quite fairly, sometimes. If you were interviewing somebody at a job, and they came in, and you said, OK, OK, Mr. McCallum, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. And I sat there, and I said to you, hi, my name's James. Uh, um, I'm pretty happy to be here, and I'm really happy for this opportunity. I'm fairly good at timekeeping. Um, sometimes I'm good at working in a group. I'm okay at working individually. Right away, you're, you're switching off. If you take all those words out, the person coming across is a very positive person. They know exactly what they want, and they know exactly what they're going for. Take all those words out of that. Take all these words out of your language that you use, and you'll find, actually, that you talk more positively, and it's, it's such... A, it's such a subtle thing, and we all do it, and I still do it. When you go through your media training with, with Bill, he actually sits you down and he films you in a room like this, and there's people just watching you, and he asks you questions, some really, really quite you know, personal questions, and you try really hard not to drop a pink elephant. And everyone at the end of this little moment gets a big handful of elephants. And it's a person who then, does the second interview, has less elephants, wins. I can't remember what I won, I think it was a mug or something like that, <laughs> or a free signed copy of his book. But he comes up with a very, very good point. The mentality shift has changed. The other one I've got down here is turning the word should into could. This comes from Steve Peters, who's a pretty well-renowned psychologist. Now, he is the chimp man who worked very, very closely with British Cycling. His ideas were that if you look at the psychology of a person, you've got three things. You've got a computer which is where everything's stored. You've got a human, which is you and I. But you've got your chimp, and your chimp is the emotion. Now, everything that you think about goes straight to the chimp. When a moment goes mad and you do something, who's ever had a moment where you sat and went, oh, I can't believe I did that. I cannot believe I said that. What am I doing? That is not me. And then the, the human has to deal with the guilt. Now, what you try and do is put autopilots into your computer. Now, he's got this, the, the books, it's too hard to explain, and I, I could have a whole day to explain it, but basically, you're trying to work on autopilots, which stops you from going into this chimp mode. Now, this is a big thing that when you look at any of the GB cyclists when they talk in an interview, they talk about process. 
We put it into a process. They remove the emotion from the situation. It's all about the process. So what was that process? Well, we come here, we do the X, we do Y, we do Z, middles. Very, very simple situation. So two very, very simple things which have changed. Mentality shifting is, for me, the, the most important thing because the psychology of what you're trying to do when you're an athlete, it, it's so twisted in your head because you're putting yourself out there and you're very vulnerable and you put yourself in these really, really emotional situations where your chimp is literally you know, is trying to get out of the cage and you get aggressive, you get, can get violent sometimes. Try not to. But these things are, you, and eventually your awareness of these things come around more and more often and you get more aware of how you talk, how you act, and it's actually just a really good thing in general for people. So if you ever get a chance, have a little look at those two books. The Chimp Paradox is a long book, so take it on holiday with you. <laughs> so the proof is in the pudding. When we talk about the mentality shift, at the top we've got a prime example of the mentality shift. These are two quotes from uh, Sir Brad. His first one is one of his most famous ones and most, use, uh, most used quotes. Kids from Kilburn don't win the Tour de France. Right away, you're looking at a situation where he's came from a r an area in London. No one around him has ever won the Tour de France. He's seen people win the Tour de France on TV. So what they've done is British Cycling have taken an athlete who is fantastically talented and very, very good at what he does and provided him with a process. They've Im implied this process to the point where you're going to be Tour de France champion in five years. Let's work to it. So, the second quote below that, it shows you the change in the mentality and the, and the realization that you can do it. It's there, it's there for the taking, you just got to seize the moments. We used to believe that we had to come from some romantic place with a fancy name somewhere in Europe, usually somewhere in Italy or France. Because these are all the images that we've perceived over the years in cycling that a Brit won in the Tour de France? <laughs> Never gonna happen. Boom, two, back to back. One of the most successful professional teams. All because of the investment and the time that British Cycling have put into creating athletes who, for, for a better use of the word, or a better word to put in there, have become machines. They became really good at what they do. They remove the emotion from the moment and they, they apply process all the time. And that's what gave them these results, and of course, at the bottom, a probably less known quote from myself. That, um, I can I I I use this quite a lot with young athletes who I do work with, uh, with Wynn, Scottish Cycling. But uh, simply put, we've all got two arms and two legs, same as everyone else. So what, if you look at the bones of it, there's absolutely no difference between you, I, Frederic, Pierre, you know, Lance, well, probably not Lance. <laughs> Bad example. But, there is fundamentally no difference to you physically. It's all about what's happening in here. So that's the proof that the mindset had changed and that we started to believe that we were actually able to do this. So that for me is pretty inspiring. You know, and we go back to the last one when I talked about the word should and could. When you say to yourself, I should really do that, notice what happens with your face, you go, I should do that, I should where it comes down and you think it's like an outcome, it's like I should do that and it's almost like a, a, a direct you have to do that. When you say could, it's a question. So you're thinking, well I could win the Tour de France, not I should win the Tour de France. Your mentality changes so you actually, it's almost an open question and there's hope in that word. So that's another thing, just changing shoulds to coulds. That's what they did there. We could win the Tour de France. Everyone said nah. They said give us five years. They went okay. Done it in two. It just shows you if you apply the process and the mentality, you can achieve pretty much anything. And here it is, that fantastic word, legacy. It's been thrown about everywhere just now. Legacy for housing, legacy for Scotland as an independent entity, legacy in sport. London was all about legacy. Everyone spoke about legacy. But what is legacy? If you look in the dictionary, it's basically anything that's handed down from the past, from an ancestor or a predecessor, like the legacy of ancient Greece. We all know about ancient Greece. We can see the legacy of ancient Greece everywhere we go. Roman roads, 
big long straight roads. Great thinking. Very, very simple. For me, legacy is a series of events that are strung together. But the great thing about those events is that when you end up with success, it leaves clues and it shows you the pathway to where you actually and how you got there. Now, when we talk about the legacy, everyone thinks 2012. What's the legacy of 2012 going to be? Now, we're currently living in the legacy of Manchester 2002. That's where the momentum be began, and that's where it all came from. In 2002, we came back with three medals. Scotland, I'm going to focus on right in a moment. Scotland came back with three medals in cycling. The next games, we came back with, I think it was six or seven. Delhi wasn't as great because of things out of our control. But when it comes to when you look at Olympic success, every single four years, Great Britain has turned up to the Olympics and we have produced nothing but gold medals. The odd silver, the odd bronze, but when you look at the table, gold has always had the biggest number. So, when you talk about Manchester's legacy, you've obviously got that point of view of the sporting success. The other thing is, is that Glasgow, for me, from 2014, will follow very, very similar suit. And it's got huge similarities to Manchester. You've also got the genesis moment when somebody decides we're going to have a Commonwealth Games and we're going to have sporting infrastructure. We're going to have a velodrome, we're going to have a new swimming pool, we're going to have all these new venues and we're going to try and inspire these people to come and fill these venues. But also from a, a social infrastructure point of view, if you, go to, if you were to go to Manchester 12 years ago and go to now, totally different place. The area in which the velodrome has been built, which is straight across from Man Manchester City's football ground, whole sports city, brand new housing, the whole area has a totally different vibe to it. It's really, really sort of, it's reincarnated that area and it's made it such a nicer place to be. I, I can remember in 2004 going and staying a in a flat which is like Coronation Street. It's now gone, but it was like the staircase was so steep and you had to leave the lights on at, when you went in in case somebody broke in. And we used to actually call it the drug den because on the street there was only two houses which weren't boarded up and weren't, weren't filled in. You could, no one else lived there. That's all gone now and they've put new skate parks in. Kids are out playing. And previously you would have never seen a kid on the street after eight o'clock at night. It was just, well, maybe not eight o'clock, six o'clock at night. Um, you've never seen that, but now it's just the whole area has been revitalised and I think Glasgow's going to go through the exact same thing. You can see it already where I used to ride past the site of Glasgow Velodrome on London Road, passing Parkhead on the right-hand side, and again, it was just filled with, you know, the area just wasn't great. There was just, you could tell that it's very, very run down. It needed a lot of infrastructure to make it better. And all that's gone now. And they've got all these new, the new village where the Commonwealth Games is going to host all the athletes. That's now going to be the new housing for a, a whole new, you know, a whole new influx of Glaswegians to start their lives. And, that, and that's fantastic, but the future legacies, they're not only coming from 2012. You've got Sochi. Who remembers seeing the kids after watching the skeleton lying in the kitchen floor on, on the baking trays? Do you ever, remember, you ever seen that picture? That's inspiring kids. That's getting them to think, I'd love to do that. So where do you go and do that? Well, we need, we'll talk about that in a second. You've also got the Andy Murray thing. We never had a winner of Wimbledon. Andy Murray wins Wimbledon. You see it time and time, year and year. I did the same. Wimbledon's on. Mum, I want a tennis racket. You're out in the tennis racket, you're batting against the wall and you're trying to sneak into a local tennis club to get a game. I did it as a kid. So the, the vehicle for motivating and inspiring these kids is already there. So how do we continue to inspire was the question. Now, for me, it's a multitude of things. There's no, when I tried to think about answering this question very, very smartly with one word or one idea, I found that it was just too difficult to do. So there's a load of different things. Role models. It's probably the first thing you think of when you're trying to inspire someone. If you have a child who can meet face-to-face -face an Olympic champion, talk to them, see they're normal, they're pretty similar to you, two arms, two legs, but they've got this medal, and he comes from Edinburgh, and his name's Chris. Wow, that is inspiring. If, if you bumped into him in the street, Chris would talk to you like a normal person. 
he's a very, very canny way of speaking to people, which makes you really feel, hang on a minute, why are we talking about me? It's like, how are you doing that? It's like he's got a magic spell when he talks to you, and it just is so interpersonal and so great at just being normal. You're like, maybe, a, you know, a young kid would look at that and go, yeah, I, I can maybe, I, I can do that Olympic thing. I can, I can maybe win some medals. So the other thing I do as well is I, I work with a, the Women in Scotland Foundation and an initiative called Champions in Schools, and we go into schools, we do three visits, uh, all working on very different things because to inspire kids to do stuff, we need to get them away from this iPhones and sitting in the room playing this, the digital age. Now, it's very hard to, s you don't see many kids, maybe I'm, I'm wrong in saying this depends on where you live and, and, and your situation, you don't see many kids out nowadays playing. And for me, that's quite sad in a way because I used to love nothing more than tearing home after school and get my rucksack off and getting into my trainers and get out and play in the street. And that seems to have been lost. And when I go into these schools, we talk about, first of all, talk about what you do and talk about how your choices in life have led you to where you are at the moment. But then we talk to them about healthy eating, but not in the way that you, you ram it down their throats. Oh, you need to eat this much and that much. Just giving them ideas. And, and the biggest thing we found was that kids don't eat breakfast. If you get loads of kids to stand up in the room and say, right, everyone, stand up. OK, sit down if you eat breakfast. 99% of them are still standing. And it's like, well, why are you not at breakfast? Oh, well, you know, I was I'm really tired. And, and uh, I said, well, do you, do you think about maybe at 11 o'clock when you should be concentrating in school, you wonder why your concentration level's not very good. It's because you're not eating anything. And kids are just eating watsits and sweeties and all the wrong things. So it's just trying to educate them on, on that point of view. The last visit I do, uh, we go and chat to them about mental attitudes, realizing that they have to do that thing up on the right, on, right. <laughs> Ownership. I know a lot of people, I spoke about this earlier, I know people at the 30-year-old who have not got a clue how to put petrol in their car because mum and dad pulls the car from them or someone else does something. It is a ridiculous thing. I've, I remember one of my mates passed his driving test and we must have been about 20 year old and we drove out to the petrol station. We're sitting in the car. You gonna, you gonna get out? What do you mean? Are you gonna get out and put the pedal in? You're aware that you have to get out of the car <laughs> and do that. He had no idea what, how it worked. He either expected somebody to come out and do it for him or that it was gonna magically evaporate in the, in the fuel tank. It, just astounding. So giving these people the opportunity to realize that they are actually in control of what's happening. You can have your support system which is here. And that can be any one of us in this room. It could be a teacher, it could be a friend of the family, it could be, it could be, you could be a, an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a parent, it could be anyone who would come out here and say, listen, you find, you gravitate to people. I've got a, a, a group of people who I, I have in my network and they vary. I've got a certain person I go to for training knowledge got a certain person I need to go if I need my ego massaged, which happens quite a lot. Um, somebody else I need to go to if I've got a, a physical problem. Somebody actually I do go to if I have mental issues, which happens sometimes. You know, you need to go speak to your psychologist and find out why you're feeling like this. No. Oh. Just, you have to have your network. So that support network is really, really key. The pathway is probably the, the main thing that we have to really think about here if we want to keep inspiring kids. We have to show them that's there, and that's what we're aiming for. So how do we get there? Now, as I said before, success leaves, you know, it leaves pathways and it leaves, it leaves little things that you can see. So you say, okay, I'm a kid, I want to become a cyclist, what do I do? Okay, come along to a cycling club? Okay, first step. Right, okay, you got a bike? No, okay, we'll give you a loan of a bike and try this bike. One step closer. Okay, let's try maybe a wee, a wee race or two. Start racing, another step closer. Okay, when we try and get you into a program, how do you fancy coming along and doing some more racing at a higher level? We do that a little bit closer. You see what I'm getting at? The pathway's already there. We just need to show them the pathway. And luckily enough, with the success we've had in brick cycling, the pathway is easily established now. It's just now about how we keep those kids in there. And I think that really comes from the ownership. 
We have the financial support. Now, <laughs> we talk about financial support. The reason our, my sport has been successful and many other sports in the UK is in part down to lottery funding. And everybody here has got a part to play with that. Everyone's bought a lottery ticket. Everyone's bought a scratch card. All these things are paid for the success of our sports. So these are all a part of that. And it's a great idea when it started. Lottery funding's paid for so much, but it's not the only way. There are other ways. I can remember writing letters to local businesses at like the age of 15, 16, trying to get some kind of financial help from the likes of uh, Tom Farmer at QuickFit. He paid for like a pair of wheels for me. Uh, I come from Uddingston, so Tunnels Caramel Wafers. Fantastic. Lots of chocolate biscuits, would be not that great. But I got, again, a little bit of money which helped me out. Uh, local councils, uh, the Hamilton Institute, uh, sorry, the Hamilton International Sports Trust, they helped me and they still help me to this day. Um, they paid for so much of my, my trips abroad and they were always there and supporting. So there's more to it than it just, you having to be part of the big, glitzy, glamorous, shiny part of funding. There's more to it. There's also nowadays social media. You, if you're good at social media nowadays, you can make plenty of money. There's plenty of idiots out there doing it. They're all over the place. Um, and cultural and mental shift is the last thing I thought about. If we, as, <laughs> it's, again, it's a very, very small thing. If we just try that little bit to be better, it, it transcends across everything. So if we just try and be a bit nicer, and that sounds very, very, if we try and be a bit nicer, and we think even just at the start, think about our language that we use, it perpetuates and everyone kind of picks up on it. All right, maybe I'll stop saying fairly, maybe I'll say firmly. It's, very, very, it's, very, it's a very, very small thing, but these all make differences. The mental shift will come along with a cultural shift. The minute we realize that we are actually good at what we do, the mental shift and the cultural shift will just be in sync with each other. So from my sport of cycling, I came from a black art, moved around about it, it's now mainstream. Everyone knows about cycling. Culturally, it's changing. We still have issues with sharing the road, which I don't think is ever going to go away. It's just one of those things. But again, more people on bikes, um, cycling is the new golf, all these things that the sport has now became more than just some guy getting in the way on, on the road. It, it's more now than it's ever been. And I think now is a, a great time for all sports, but obviously I'm very biased with my sport of cycling. We're in a massive moment now where there's a bubble and it's just expanding and expanding. 2014, for me, is going to be massive. I think we don't really realise how big the Commonwealth Games is going to be when it comes to Glasgow. It's kind of happening in the background. Everything's kind of taking place. But I know for a fact when you walk into Hamden, it, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be unbelievable. Opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies in Celtic Park. I can remember coming home off that plane in 2006 and I was inspired by my colleagues. I was inspired by everyone. I was, I was a part of this massive thing. It's like, what? This is this unbelievable. You know, it, it just felt so good. And the fact now that I can stand here and talk to you guys about my experiences, that is, I think, the key to inspiring people, is showing them that it can be done. We just need to, if the infrastructure's in place, we have the, we have the, the, you know, the nuts and bolts, we have the venues. It's now just about taking the pathway, giving them ownership, having the support network, and letting them be close to these role models. So that's pretty much what I think. It's a bit of a long explanation of what I think and how we would go about inspiring a generation. But I think um, when 2014 happens, I think it's going to blow up big time. It's going to be unbelievable. There's going to be so, there's going to be kids wanting to do every kind of sport. And I think it's just a fantastic time for sport in general. But obviously for my sport, cycling, I can't wait to get there. And I'd like to thank you all for sitting here and listening to me. So if you've got any questions, I'd happily take them. Wipe the sweat off my forehead now. Um, you talked about the support network, and the people you mentioned were mainly professional people. Not all professional. No, no. Um, 
when it comes to my support system, uh, a lot of them are people I've just met generally through the sport. Mm -hmm. But even friends of my wife, they are pretty supportive as well. It, it, it's quite... Uh, I'm really, really lucky in the fact that I have got so many people supporting me. My parents, for instance, they're my main support network. Cause they were the ones who were always there behind me when I was a kid, and they still well, are behind me. That, that was the bit that interested me, in that your parents introduced you to cycling. Uh, Chris Hoy's parents didn't. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, Andy Murray has Judy. <laughs> yep. Um, how difficult is it for a child without parental support to move forward? It's very, I'd, I'd say it's very, very hard, but that's where we've all got a part to play. If you're a teacher at school, it doesn't just have to be sport, it can be art, it can be music, it can be anything that kid wants to do. We have to just inspire them. I mean, I'm mostly talking from a sporting point of view here, but it just takes very small things for kids to be inspired and continue doing things. Likewise, it takes very, very small things to put kids off of doing things. When I was at school, I wanted to be an artist, and it just took one teacher to say the wrong thing to me at the wrong moment. And I was done with art. Simple as that. Like that. Done. Never done it ever again. And the comment I got from the teacher was, McCallum, you want to go to art school? You could even make it as a janitor. <laughs> and it's like, okay. Uh, and now when I look back, I understand it. Maybe it had a bad day. Teenagers are pretty hard to deal with. But the way in which that came across to me made me just think, well, why am I even bothering? Make them feel that what they're doing is worthwhile. You know, that's the, that's the key thing. And I was always lucky. I talk about being a cyclist, but I was doing sports all the time from like the age of five. I was doing gymnastics, which then led on to football, which led on to rugby. I think it was because I was hyperactive. My parents just wanted to make sure I slept well. And, and, <laughs> and I, I get out of their hair for a couple of hours. But with any sport, when you start doing it full time and professionally, or <sighs> trying to, it becomes all consuming. Even before I was professional, when I, when I was that little picture of me, cycling was everything to me. I, I never had time for anything else. You know, it's just get home, get my bike, get home, get my bike. And then the weekends, I got to go out and explore with the local clubs and stuff like that. And it was just a, a, gr a great time for me. But again, it comes down to those people as well, the club members, people that own local bike shops, help and support you. Just people generally want to be interested in what you're doing. You know, that, that for me is a huge thing to have that support network, just somebody to listen to you. You know, because we don't always need reassurance. We just sometimes, sometimes we just need somebody to talk to. And I think that's really, really key. But we've all got a part to play in that, I think, and it, it transcends everything. It isn't just about sport. It's about, you know, if a kid's wanting to become great at art, like, for instance, maybe don't tell them they'll be lucky if they can be a janitor. You know, it's pretty simple. At the back. You've said that uh, this is your final year. Yeah. So what next? <laughs> Good question. Um, oh, uh, I can't possibly uh, dis disclose that to you. Um, right now, I've just became a dad, actually, about six months ago. So I think I'm in a, a lucky position right now where um, I, with my sport, I get taken away an awful lot. And I come back and a lot changes. And I want now to be at home and be a dad. It's just, I feel it's quite a unique situation for myself to actually have time to watch, you know, my little girl grow up, which is, not a lot of people get that opportunity. It doesn't matter what you do in life. Sometimes the guy goes to work at nine o'clock in the morning and doesn't come back till six and sees the kid for an hour before they go to sleep. And uh, I'm lucky that I can train from like 10 in the morning to three in the afternoon and then come home and spend time with, with my little girl. But from that point, for me, I want to just be a dad first and foremost. Um, and then I'll, I'm lucky enough that my season finishes in August and I still get paid till December, so I can have a little busman's holiday. But um, looking at probably, I do a lot of coaching just now and hopefully going to move into something within the sport, whether it be events or coaching or something around about it, because I think it would be pretty naive and silly of me to have spent 24 years within the sport and basically be the person that I am because of the sport and not put something back into it. Because I like, I like the fact that I've still got that connection with it. And if I went cold turkey, oh my God, it would loony bin. I'd be, I'd be a nightmare. I would just wouldn't be able to cope. Because it's, it is, I am who I am because of my sport. So it's a work in progress. It's probably the easiest way of answering it. A long answer, but it's a work in progress. But definitely something still within the sport, I think. Um, the, the drug um, abuse exposes must have been a bit of a negative in your... 
um, in your field of sport? Yeah, th cycling's. It doesn't. It doesn't help when you find that when you look for red cars, you suddenly see a lot of red cars. It's like the same thing happened with cycling is that cycling we have some of the, the strictest drug testing out of every sport. If I'm a footballer and I have an injury, I can get a cortisone injection straight into the muscle, no questions asked. If I'm a professional cyclist and I have a cortisone injection, it's a masking agent, it's a steroid, it's covering something up, you're positive. So our, our rules and our regulations, as the toughest out of all the sports out there, but there's still sports who are really, really, and especially sports in America, with, such as American football, baseball, it's all coming out now, and I really think that cycling in the next five to ten years will actually, right now it's, it's cleaner than it's ever been. But in the next five to ten years, you'll find there's going to be a lot of stuff coming out about other sports and just how dirty they really are. I can see it from a bike rider's point of view, that when I'm racing now, especially when you've got racing in France, I think this has also helped the, the, the change in the mentality within, within the sport in the UK because the Italians can't cheat as much. They can't have their doctors and the French can't do it. The French are probably the first ones to actually try and stop the doping. But all the Italian doctors are getting caught, all the Spanish doctors are getting caught, all the Portuguese guys are getting caught. And that's great for the sport and it's cleaning it up. And that's helped that shift for us to actually realise, you know what, if everyone's on water, we can do this. Which has obviously helped an awful lot. But um, I do really think that <laughs> in the next four or five years, cycling won't be at uh, top of the headlines for, for the drug. I, ho I hope it's not. You know, for me, for someday to. It only takes one silly decision, and you've got to live with that for the rest of your life. And it's not just you, it's your kids. And that's what Lance Armstrong said. He said the thing that made him come out and say, I did it, was his son defending him on Twitter, saying, How dare you say about my dad? And from my, my personal perspective, it just takes me to do something once and get a really good result from it. And then somebody comes to me and says, hello, James, I'd like to give you £200,000 a year or over that for the next four years, all because you did this. What are you going to do? It's a huge, huge dilemma. Do you then think, I'll just take it and I'll just keep doing it and hopefully I'll get away with it. Ho and it is hopefully I'll get away with it. If you get caught, you're buggered. Or they just go, nah, I'm, not, I'm never going to do it because I don't want to live in that moment. I don't want to have to make that decision because then I have to continue doing it. And the more I do, the more I get caught up in it. And it's such a massive, massive vicious circle. So from my point of view, the sport is definitely, you can see it now when you go to races, there's, there's less incredible things happening at the lower levels. There's still the odd moment. But I, I like to just say, if it looks like a duck and sounds like a duck, it's usually a duck. So hopefully that answers your question. I, I believe quite a lot of prominent UK cyclists have today written to some local authorities asking for new moves to be made to make cycling um, out of racing cycling, make it safer. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? I'm not sure if you're involved yourself. I'm not, I'm not personally involved with it, but <laughs> I am involved with it every day. Um, I think there's a, what they're basically trying to do is, Chris Boardman has been working really, really hard with councils and trying to get initiatives up there to let people realise that, and, it's, uh, and, and I hate it when people talk about it, it's not, neither party is wrong and neither party is right, it's about sharing the situation. We have to understand that that person who's riding that bike in front of you, if you hit them with a two tonne object, it's going to go like that. Worst case scenario, it's just going to roll about and be a bit bent. Nine times out of ten, it just explodes. But that's the reality of the situation. And it only takes a few seconds to get round that person. And it is literally a couple of seconds. But also, that person could be a son, a daughter, a father, an uncle, an aunt. And that's really what they're trying to get out there. They're trying to make people aware that, OK, there's idiots in both camps. I, I spend a lot of time out now when I'm riding my bike shouting at other cyclists, no wonder people want to run over me. And it's just, unfortunately, it's like taxi drivers and bus drivers. Oh, bloody taxi drivers. I know some great taxi drivers. And I, know, I know some great bus drivers who are actually bike riders. And it's trying to get that mentality shift from that weird guy riding 
uh, from a, a weird idea that you only wear lycra and that's all you do all day. The fact that you're a normal person is trying to get that across to people as well. That, you know, I'm, I'm just like you. I've got to go home, I've got to pay wages. But unfortunately, I am the same as Joe Bloggs riding to work. But unfortunately, I'm at work. I don't walk into you working, poke you in the face with a pencil. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. And I think we're really going to struggle with trying to change that, that culture. But it's trying to get that understanding of the reality of the situation out there to people. But I, I, I agree with a lot of drivers that there are idiots on the road on bikes. Likewise, I agree with a lot of cyclists that some of the drivers ain't that great either. So hopefully that answers your question. Any more? Oh, someone at the back. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to ask, you know, you said about the pathway and role models, who you see the responsibility lying with to actually show the pathway or to allow an opportunity to meet the role model. Where does that come in and who's going to actually make this vision sort of reality? Yeah, uh, very good question. There's, um, I've always been quite critical, especially of Scottish cycling, that they don't actually use their athletes very, very well. We tend to have an athlete goes and wins something and that's it. They don't bring them in. Fortunately, this time, a prime example of showing the pathway and having someone part of that team. Chris Hoy is going to be there at Commonwealth Games. He's going to be there for you to talk to. Right, Chris, I'm panicking here, what do I do? He's going to be there, not necessarily for myself, but for, you've got to remember that a lot of these athletes is going to be the first Commonwealth Games. And, and it doesn't just have to be around cycling. To have him there as a, Olympic, uh, as a 100 metre runner and say, Chris, what, how did you cope with this? And just actually, just again, talking to somebody about it, that, that just makes it so much easier. Sharing it, you know, halves it, and it makes it a lot easier to get your head around it. But I really, I really do believe, I firmly believe that we need to take who we have and bring them in and use them properly. How we go about that is, is a massive discussion in itself. And like I say, I've always been quite critical of the way that Scottish Cycling in itself has never really used its athletes very, very well. Again, it's getting them in, chatting, and realising they're just normal people. Because you have these people on a pedestal because of what they've done, but that for me is integral to get them part of, part of, when the kids are starting, you know, at ten, fifteen, you know, and then sharing their experiences is really, really important as well. So, I think that's probably the best way of going about it. To be honest with you. Any more questions? <laughs> Hello. Thanks. Um, you said you just recently had a daughter. Will you be pushing your daughter into cycling? And if so, why? And if not, why not? I think it's only one question per person. Um, to be honest with you, it, it, the shoe is definitely on the other foot when it comes to being a parent. You obviously want everything... Um, you want everything for your kid, don't you? You want them to, to strive, you want to push them, you want to have them make something for themselves. But I think I'll... I hope, I'm fairly sure, I'm pretty positive that I would like to, there we go, another pink elephant, um, whatever she wants to do, she can do, 100%, 100% support behind her, life's what, you know, what comes to you, I'm just going to be there for her, and just do what I can to support her, which is really all you can do, because she'll do what she wants anyway, to be honest with you, you know, it's like, don't touch that, touch it, <laughs> it's just, uh, it would be great, you know, it'd be, it'd be great for her to, I may slightly steer her into cycling, but whatever she wants to do, to be honest with you, it's just, it's quite cool just now that I can take her to races and she's kind of, you know, you get to take her on the podium and that sort of stuff, and you'd like to think that things like that can kind of, when they see pictures of it as they get older, oh, my daddy was a cyclist. And one of the coolest things actually is on a birth certificate that says, occupational father, professional cyclist. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so that's always going to be there, irrespective of if everything I have in Owen of my memory of my career disappears. It's always going to say that on a birth certificate, and that's always going to make her question it, I hope. So, yeah, whatever she wants. At the back. Sorry, the question is, so did you see Mark Adams' daughter last week on, on Twitter? He's got a wee Twitter pub, she and daddy on the yeah. bike, so there's a wonderful picture. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's that moment when you realise, I'm kind of getting more and more at the point where it's like, it's only a bike race. There's more to life than just bike racing. 
you know, but you only get to that point by being at that point. Uh, when you're not at that point, it's, everything's about cycling, everything's about winning and beating that person and training and numbers and weighing your food. Whereas now it's like, <sighs> dad's about his bike. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's bizarre. But yeah, I think that definitely brings it home to you. But probably for Cav, it's quite a good stability thing for him because whew, a lot going on in there. That's for sure. That's for sure. Any more? What's your favourite event? Ooh, to do or watch? Uh, to do. To do, uh, I would say track racing. I love track racing, just the idea that when you explain a track race to someone, the bare minimum of what actually happens, you're on a bike, no brakes, one gear, you can't stop pedalling, and you're going to do it in a 45 degree banking, and you're going to be really close to people, at any point they can fall off, and your race is over. I'm selling it to you, am I? Uh, it's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> uh, just the... Um, I spoke to Chris Hoy just a few weeks ago at the Scottish Bike Show, and he says that now when he does motor racing, he started doing motor racing and Le Mans style racing, he says that the adrenaline that he got from cycling, for that split second, he now has that for like an hour, which, pff, trust me, that's, that's a lot of adrenaline. For me, it's the exact same. The adrenaline you have, just the bumping and barging, and, and the idea that you do it wrong for one second, and it's gone. It's just that, whoa, you're, you're on edge all the time. You're absolutely switched on. Between that and probably city centre racing. I, I love city centre racing, just the crowds, and even more so now that it's not just a, one man and his dog and you're racing in some moor in the middle of nowhere with nobody really caring. You're coming into city centres. I mean, in three weeks' time, we're going to have a race around the grass market, the tour series, and the crowds are going to be phenomenal. And it's just, for me, being a local, a local guy, getting the idea that I can race around here and have friends, family, and a lot of people I don't actually know shouting your name, which is still quite bizarre to get a head around. How do these people know you? It's just, it's just such a great, great event. And the shorter events for me are, are, are more fun, I think. I love actually watching sprinting on the track and the Kieran. We have the, you ever seen the race? We have the funny little motorbike. Everyone asks, what's that guy doing? That race. <laughs> just the track racing in itself is it's such a simple, pure version of cycling. First across the line ones. And it's very gladiatorial. It's quite cool. They're in an arena and rawr, loads of stuff can happen. It's <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, oh, a couple more. Um, I just wanted to ask how we would get you to come and speak to the kids in our um, cycling club in Linlithgow. Um, my husband's a coach, and I know that if is you came along, you would really the inspire them. It's the Aquarian? It is, Aye. yeah, yeah. Just get Matt, Matt to send me a wee message. Okay. That's no problem. <laughs> I, I came to your Christmas cross a couple of years ago. Yeah. 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 I, you're doing good work, by the way. Keep it up. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. See what you guys are doing? That is key. It's a fundamental thing you guys are doing there. Bringing kids into the sport, even with your, your boots and spur, that's just, it's cool. You know, it's a bit of an, in, we're having a bit of an in conversation here, so. <laughs> but keep doing what you're doing. That's exactly what we need, and we need more of that. Any more questions? Yes, this might be the final, final one, maybe. If you're quick, we've got three minutes left. You've talked a little bit about sports and your own sport and how they manage their pathway. Do you think sports across the board need to take more responsibility for when an athlete doesn't make the grade in their sport and assisting them to find um, a cross into another sport. Um, quite often, athletes that don't make the grade are then just discarded by that sport and left to, yeah. to cope with the disappointment. Actually, I fell full of that in 2002. I was, uh, as I say, you were told to come with games. It's a massive thing for your country. Go there, go there, go there. And you go there and you do it and you come back and it's like, what's next? Oh, that's it done. It's like, well, what do I do now? And you're, you're lost. And I, I was lost to the sport for eight months. I didn't know what to do. I was in a really weird place. I did, was everything I had basically worked my arse off to get to was now, what's, what do I do with this now? Fortunately now, uh, Scottish Institute's taken quite a big part in this. They do a lot of lifestyle management. And um, you get to go there uh, and talk about like the questions being asked, what they want to do after sports, you can discuss these things and just really see what your options are because for an athlete, I, I, I like to think I'm kind of normal person. I've always kept my, my, my finger in with being working. I used to be a nurse and then previous, now, previous to be turned professional again, I, was, uh, I worked in events. 
So I've got a lot of background and other stuff, and I always like to keep myself busy because I found cycling was just, you need to be really good at doing nothing. And fortunately, the internet was invented, so it's, it's really easy to do nothing nowadays. But um, from that point of view, it really needs to, it can be quite a dangerous thing, I think, to, for the mentality of athletes. A lot of athletes go through a lot of depression just because chemical releases are totally different when you're not competing. You don't have that, you know, adrenaline, and you need somewhere to event that. But I think um, the Institute's definitely taken a lot more interest in that and definitely trying to help people sort of cross over into being normal, really, because you are really being a normal, because you're an athlete, you're not, you're not normal. You're mental, <laughs> you know? Any more questions? That us? Well, thank you very much. Thanks for that. Stay where you are for a moment. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. Uh, my university, Harriet Watt University, and uh, our co-host, Napier University, we're proud to have uh, looked after what's been such a splendid event. However, I reserve my main thanks for the man who's done all the work. James, you've achieved things that the rest of us can only dream of. I have probably left it a little late myself to become a professional cyclist. However, I think what you have shown us is that we can achieve a great deal more than uh, we think. And why do I say that? I guess when we see champion athletes, or indeed anyone who has uh, had such uh, uh, a great achievement in their career, we tend to concentrate on the moment of success. We see the photograph on the podium, and we forget what went into it. I think we know there was a lot of hard work, but what we don't realize is that there are the same ups and downs as each of us find in our everyday lives too. And in a sense, that's what makes it important. What makes that moment of success have significance, why it is worthwhile, is because of what has gone into it. And all of us can put something into a thing and expect to achieve not your success, but our success, and that's the thing that is important. So why am I thanking you? I'm thanking you mainly because you've done what you set out to do, which is to inspire us. Thank you for inspiring us. And I'm afraid you don't get away without the corporate gifts. I'd also like to thank you all for making it slightly less nerve-wracking and smiling at me. James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.